the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. My name is Yaron Kapitulnik and I am the new Shabbat and Holiday Coordinator for the 92nd Street Y. And when I say new, I mean new. Today is my first day on the job. So I have the privilege of having you as my first crowd. <laughs> Um, and I also, not only I am new here, but today is the first meeting of our new season of the Shabbat Salon, a, the, the Jazz Age and the Creation of American Jewish Culture. And before we start, I just want to kind of remind you, you know how many times you hear people complaining that if, you know, the day is not long enough, we have so many things we have to do. And if we only had one more hour a day, only one more hour, we would be so much happier, right? You're familiar with that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can all rejoice because that day is today. Very few people actually realize that Shabbat is the only day of the week that doesn't have 24 hours. Shabbat starts just before sunset and ends about an hour and some after sunset when it's total dark. So here it is. Every week you have a day that has 25 hours or more. The big question is, what do you do with that hour? What do you do with that hour? So we're delighted that this Shabbat you chose to spend that hour with us. And we're so happy to have you here. And in a moment, I will present our speaker. And I just want to remind you that at the end of our lecture, you're all invited to join us for an Oneg Shabbat. Oneg means pleasure. And we'll unveil the tables here. And we have some desserts and coffee and wine and soft drinks. And you're all welcome to stay with us and celebrate. We'll have a small, a short kiddush and we'll say the blessing over the bread, and then you're all welcome to mingle and to enjoy. So without further ado, let me introduce Ted Merwin. Ted teaches religion and Jack studies at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, where, is, where he also directs the Milton B. Ashbell Center for Jewish Life. For the last six years, he has served as the chief theater critic of the New York Jewish Week, which is the largest circulation Jewish newspaper in the United States. His articles appear in newspapers throughout the country, including it's a long list. The New York Times, The Moment Magazine, Hadassah, The Sondheim Review, Metro West Jewish News, Baltimore Jewish Times, Atlanta Jewish Times, and St. Louis, St. Louis Jewish Light. He holds a PhD in theater from the City University of New York Graduate Center. Please, ladies and gentlemen, Ted Marwin. Thank you, Yaron. I'm still working on the math from, from this. So I guess this means that Sunday, we only have 23 hours, right? <laughs> okay. An eight-day week. Okay. So I want to wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom, and it's really a pleasure to see all of you here tonight on such a rainy night in New York. And so I'm really very grateful that you decided to, to come here. And um, actually, I'm thinking now about this whole question of religion. I'm going to be speaking tomorrow at an Orthodox synagogue in Manhattan. And the rabbi said to me, you know, I know that you're going to be speaking about Jewish culture, but this is an orthodox shul, so could you mention religion somehow in your talk? <laughs> and I didn't want to say, you know, I hate to break it to you, rabbi, but one of the things that I suggest in my book is that the second generation of American Jews, the children of Jewish immigrants, moved away from religious observance in creating and inventing a form of Jewish identity, which was primarily secular and primarily cultural, and that many Jews in my generation and in the generation of students who I work with at Dickinson really define themselves much more in cultural terms than in religious terms. But I think there's a lot to be uh, said about this, and I'm hoping that afterwards maybe some of the discussion that we can have is whether or not a Jewish identity that is primarily based on cultural Judaism is uh, transmissible to future generations, whether it has any staying power, so to speak, because I have doubts about that. But I also really want to celebrate the culture that was given birth to during the Jazz Age, which was the 1920s. So I guess the first question that most of you are probably wondering is, how did a 30-something 
guy from Great Neck, New York, get interested in the culture of the early 20th century. Actually, I was, I was in my 20s when I started researching all of this. So how did a 20-something get interested in the culture of the 1920s? And the answer to that really lies with, if I can get this to work. OK, why is it not working? Do I have it upside down? Can you hit the forward button? Still not working. Here we go. Uh, lies with my grandparents. Jean and Lewis Kaplan, my maternal grandparents. Um, I was very close to them when I was growing up on Long Island. And I actually grew up in quite a, a secular family. I ended up, uh, my family never belonged to a synagogue. And I actually ended up having a bar mitzvah when I was 20, when I was in college, which is another, a story for another day. But my, I was very close to my grandparents. And I was always fascinated by their seeming to exist in an almost completely Jewish world. The way that they talked, you know, we would always say to them, say car, grandma, you know, when she would say car, 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 and we would say, say car. <laughs> the way that they talked, the, the foods that they ate, you know, they didn't keep kosher, um, but they would, uh, they would as soon have eaten a ham sandwich or, um, or even pizza or Chinese food than, um, you know, then bought kosher meat. I mean, each, either one was completely, you know, they, they didn't keep kosher, but they also only ate traditional Jewish foods. Um, the vacations that they took to Miami Beach and the Catskills, my, my grandmother always talked about going up the mountains, and my sister and I always had this image of them, like, you know, climbing up the mountains somehow. <laughs> um, the neighborhoods that they lived in, their friends, everything about them, their, their whole attitude towards life, and including the entertainers whom they idolized and who they watched on Broadway and on film and uh, on television. And so I don't think I was really consciously thinking about this as a child, but uh, growing up in a family which wasn't particularly ethnically identified, I, was, uh, I think I was quite struck by the fact that they seemed entirely Jewish in everything that they did, did in everything that they said, and in everything that they seemed to feel. And when I was in graduate school and I started doing some research on their generation, I realized that their generation was also the first generation in American history of Jews, first generation of Jews, to become successful in American society, to really join the mainstream of, of American culture. How, how could this be that they could manage to exist in such a thoroughly and entirely Jewish world, and yet also be part of this very, very successful generation. And that was one of the things that started motivating me in terms of looking at uh, what their Jewish identity was based on, and how it came to be that, uh, that their generation did develop such a confident sense of themselves as both Jews and Americans. Uh, this is me. <laughs> Um, about five years ago. Um, who is this? This is Gershwin, right? And Gershwin is probably, you know, one of the greatest symbols of this, of this era. Gershwin, who took the music of early 20th century French composers like, uh, like Maurice Ravel and, and Claude Debussy, and somehow melded their music with, uh, with jazz and with Tin Pan Alley tunes to create a whole new American idiom. And by the way, um, a lot of when I when I give this talk, um, actually this is the first time that I've given this book talk. So um, this is kind of the launch of my book tour. But I'm going to be giving it all over the country, and in a lot of places where I'm going to be speaking, the Jewish community centers and synagogues and so on told me that they're arranging for a jazz band to be part of the entertainment. And I I didn't expect that at all. I mean, I've been very struck by that and kind of amused by it because I didn't mean that at all in titling the book. I didn't mean to make any um, reference to jazz in titling the book, um, you know, and using the, in the words jazz age in the title of the book. Uh, you know, jazz is something that, you know, long predates the 1920s. Uh, when j jazz was, yeah, I mean, jazz was clearly an important part of the 20s, but the word jazz was used to refer to any kind of popular music at the time. And that's why when we think of the jazz singer, the play and the film. You know, when Al Jolson is singing Mammy, you know, he's not singing jazz. <laughs> he's singing a popular 
you know, popular song of the day. Okay, so, uh, so Gershwin. And uh, Gershwin, as I said, is, is kind of a symbol of the exuberance of the 1920s, and as a Jew who became so successful in this period, I think he can stand as a, as a symbol for us. Um, but I really want to talk more generally about the journey that the second generation undertook. We hear a lot about the immigrant journey and what it meant for people to come to these shores from Eastern Europe and from other countries. We don't talk very much about the second generation's journey. We kind of assume that they were born here and they don't have the same magnitude of, 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 of journey that they had to undergo. But I see this really as a, as a threefold journey. The first one is out of the Lower East Side. The Lower East Side figures in almost all of the Jewish culture of this era the vaudeville routines, the Broadway plays, the films. There's tremendous, tremendous. I mean, I, I consider this really the golden age of American Jewish culture. There was so much cultural production during the 1920s that reflected, that explored, that exhibited, that celebrated, and that satirized Jewish life in New York. And most of this has not really been, been looked at. I mean, people know about plays like A.B.'s Irish Rose. They've heard the name, probably never seen it. It's not a very good play. But it was a phenomenon during the 1920s. It ran for five years on Broadway. It was a play written by a non-Jewish woman, Ann Nichols, that ended up earning millions of dollars and being seen all over the world. And you know, why would a play about Jewish life in New York be so phenomenally popular? That's one of the things that I'm really, that I'm, that I'm looking at. Um, so, um, so the first journey that the, that the second generation had to, un, had to take was out of the Lower East Side, to which they remained extremely connected, though, emotionally and nostalgically. It was a place that they saw as kind of symbolizing the Jewishness that they feared they were abandoning to some extent. It was their parents' generation, it was their parents' neighborhood, and it was in many ways their parents' Jewishness that they felt a lot of guilt about, uh, about abandoning in many ways. Okay, well, this is one of, one of those really iconic uh, images of the, of the Lower East Side, which, um, you know, at the turn of the century was more crowded than, than Calcutta or Bombay. It was not a pleasant place to live. It was uh, a place of exploitation, of poverty, of squalor. And, uh, and yet it also, um, very quickly began, uh, became seen in the culture, in the popular culture of the 1920s, as a very picturesque kind of place. Picturesque and charming, and already kind of a tourist destination for people to come back to with their children, because they had left it. People left the Lower East Side as soon as they could, and they moved to the Bronx, and they moved to Brooklyn, and some of them moved to Harlem. But the Lower East Side, you know, I mean, something like two million Jews came to America between 1881 and 1921. And, um, you know, the Lower East Side only held maybe a quarter million people. So we know that people left it as soon as they possibly could. As soon as they started building bridges to Brooklyn, <laughs> people left the Lower East Side. So, um, so, and already by the 1920s, people were bringing their children back to the Lower East Side to say, look, this is where I grew up, you know, this, and they would take them shopping. And the city already was beginning to uh, clean up the neighborhood by making the push carts more, you know, standardized and, you know, sending the sanitation crews and whatever. So it was, a, it was kind of a romanticized vision of the Lower East Side that was being created both in actuality and also in the many uh, plays and films and vaudeville routines of the period. Okay. Uh, could you, next one. Uh, so here's an example actually from a book of the 1920s called Mendel Morantz of a... Uh, what looks like an immigrant Jewish woman bringing her daughter back on a shopping trip uh, to the Lower East Side. Okay, because you... And this is one of the films that was set on the Lower East Side. This was uh, really the first important film um, from 1920, a film called Humoresque, and it's about a Jewish viol violinist who becomes very, very famous, and um, he is kind of like a Yasha Heifetz, and he... Um, 
And this is a scene in which he is uh, with his uh, fiance, who he's going to marry. And it's very interesting because you see the contrast between the residents of the neighborhood and the way that they're depicted in the film. This is a silent film. And, um, and the way that he and his girlfriend are, are shown. And, and you can see they're really going for that local flavor. Actually, this film and many of the films of the 20s that were set in the Lower East Side were filmed with extras from the neighborhood. They were filmed on location, and they were filmed with extras from the neighborhood. OK, the next one, please. Uh, does anyone know what this is? The lobby of the, the entry to the Chrysler building. Again, I mean, as I said before, Jews became uh, actually a better example would probably be the Chanin building diagonally across from the Chrysler building. Erwin Chanin was one of the most important uh, developers of the day. And he built uh, not just this building, but he built um, Broadway, a lot of Broadway theaters and apartment houses and so on in, in, uh, in New York City. And so I see this as kind of the, uh, I have this phrase, the Art Deco Jew, which I looked on Google and have not seen uh, used anywhere else. There's Art Deco Jew Lurie, but there's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the concept of the Art Deco Jew, you know, the <laughs> kind of all the glitz and glamour and so on of the, of the period that became imported in some way into, into Jewish life. Okay, the next one, please. Oh, and so Ziegfeld, Ziegfeld, Flo Ziegfeld is also a good example of, um, because a lot of the uh, Broadway producers during the year, not just the builders, but a lot of the producers uh, were also, of course, Jewish. And it's been estimated that something like a half of the entertainment business in New York at the turn of the last century was comprised of Jews. It's probably higher than that now. I don't know. <laughs> OK, the next one, please. Oh, this is, um, if you see in the corner, this is uh, Jolson's 59th Street Theater. These are theaters that don't exist anymore. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Broadway's Lost Theaters. And um, this is uh, an Eddie Cantor. Uh, you can see on the marquee Eddie Cantor's name. OK, next one, please. Uh, this, I don't think, is a Jewish woman, but I just picked it as an example of the, <laughs> of the f kind of flapper culture of the, uh, of the, of the era. And I, I really like the pearls. I don't know why. I just really like the pearls. OK. OK, next one. Um, and here's another example, 1929, right? Um, what, does anyone know what this film is? This is Coconuts from 1920, the first Marx Brothers feature film. Actually, they were reportedly so disappointed with it that when they saw a print of it, they tried to take it back and destroy it. They, they, they were not happy at all with, with the way that they looked on film. But fortunately, they weren't allowed to do that. But, uh, but you get the sense of you know, the kind of the Jewish character in the center surrounded by all of the opulence of the, of the, of the age. OK, the next one, please. Uh, anybody know who this is? This is Arnold Rothstein, again, another example, right, of the, uh, you know, the kind of preeminent Jewish gangster and, and bootlegger of the, of the era. And he also, I mean, speaking of A.B.'s Irish Rose, which I'm a little bit obsessed with, because you know, I kind of started this whole book, actually, was started as an essay on that play, as, a, as an article on that play. Um, he was one of the backers of that, of that play. It would not have taken place without, uh, without his uh, financial investment. Okay, next one, please. Uh, anybody know who this is? Very good. OK, now, why Henry Ford? The reason why I wanted to put in a, because Henry Ford was the, exactly right, Henry Ford was the most uh, influential anti-Semite of the 1920s. Yes, uh, in the Dearborn Independent. And he, he was uh, responsible. They say he never read what he published, that it was published by other people, but I don't believe it. Um, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and other, you know, you know, uh, viciously anti-Semitic creeds, and basically, you know, said that Jews were taking over the uh, American economy and so on. I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure why he was so obsessed with it, but we know that Hitler was an admirer of of, of his. Um, so it was a, and he ended up apologizing towards the end of the decade. He ended up recanting and apologizing, but it was a little, a little bit late. And actually, his grandson um, funded the. Um, I think 1997 showing of Schindler's List on television, completely commercial free. The first, commercial, uh, first television showing of Schindler's List as kind of, I guess, a way of making amends. I learned last night that the Ford Foundation is now in partnership with the New Israel Fund. Interesting. Interesting. OK, next one, please. OK, so in order for Jews to begin to um, promote a more positive image of themselves in popular culture, they had to overcome a lot in terms of the kinds of very stereotypical representations that existed at the time. So this is an example of a very anti-Semitic cartoon 
from earlier in the 20th century. And uh, one of the things that I talk about in the book is I actually have a, have a section on cartoons and the way that cartoons began to shape the way that people saw, saw Jews. There was a cartoon called A.B. the Agent about a kind of short, rotund, uh, lackluster, kind of bumbling automobile salesman. And, um, and he was a good example of kind of a cleaned up, what they would call a cleaned up Jewish, uh, Jewish figure. Um, this is Frank Bush. He was one of the most famous of the Hebrew comics of the turn of the century. Hebrew comics meaning Hebrew meaning the type of comedy that they did. Um, Hebrew comedy was second only really to the minstrel show in late 19th and early 20th century culture, mostly non-Jews who impersonated Jews on stage who dressed up in you know long black coats and black hats and so on, and spoke in very you know kind of twisted Yiddish accents and and um, talked, you know, raved about money and greed and so on and so forth. Um, but I really see Smith and Dale. Oh, sorry, I've been trying to let you guys guess uh, who the people were. I assume that Smith and Dale is pro probably known to most of the people in this, in this audience, although nobody whatsoever from my generation has ever even heard of them. Um, unfortunately, because I think, I think they're very important as a kind of transition from, a, from an older style of, of Jewish comedy. Um, which was um, based in many ways on malapropism, right? On using use of the wrong word, the, the, the beginning English speaker not really knowing, not really having a command of the language. Um, and I think they really adapt that style of humor, but begin to push it in a more, in a more uh, sympathetic, sympathetic direction. I'm a, a big, big fan of theirs. Uh, next one, please. Fanny Bryce, I'll be playing a Fanny Bryce song in a, in a little bit. Um, Fanny Bryce is, was also one of the most successful um, entertainers of her day. I mean, you know, multi, multi-millionaire. And uh, all based on routines that were in Yiddish, I mean, you know, with a Yiddish accent, even though she herself supposedly never spoke Yiddish, didn't know Yiddish, adopted a Yiddish accent and portrayed all kinds of characters that satirized both Jews and other kinds of immigrants like Indian uh, and other kinds of ethnic groups. And, um, and sort of developed out of this very, you know, uh, gawky uh, style, she, uh, she somehow developed something that became phenomenally popular. Next one, please. Okay. Who are these? It's not, it's not Jolson, actually. Jessel and Cantor, right. Cantor, Jolson, and Jessel are like the triumvirate, you know. Uh, here, you can do the next one. Okay, so I, yeah, I found two that sort of mirror each other. So um, there's been a lot actually in recent years written about blackface and with a particular focus on Jolson, the jazz singer, and how blackface supposedly, you know, Jews use blackface, Jews um, impersonated African Americans as a way of distancing themselves from blacks and showing that this is what we're not, and thus, hence, becoming becoming white in the process. That's the kind of current scholarship on that mostly Michael Rogan, who is the late professor from the uh, University of California at Berkeley, uh, in a very, very influential book called um, Blackface, White Noise, um, advanced a few years ago. And so the blackface is really, you know, when you think of Jewish entertainers in the 1920s, I think for most of us, Jolson is the first one to come to, is to, come to mind. But what I tried to do in this book is to argue that blackface is actually much less important that many scholars of popular culture have suggested that blackface was, you know, it was definitely done by almost every, almost all of the Jewish entertainers, but it was done by almost all entertainer, entertainers of all stripes, and it was, in many cases, it was dropped as soon as possible. For example, Sophie Tucker was known as a coon shouter. That was her original, you know, reputation, but she dropped it as soon as she could and, uh, and stopped doing it. So my focus in this book is really on what I guess you would call Jewface rather than blackface, on Jewish entertainers doing Jewish material and really changing the perception of Jews in American society um, in the process. And not just changing the perception of Jews in the minds of other people, but also to some extent changing the perceptions of Jews in their own minds, because I, I think we always tend to internalize the stereotypes that other, other people have of us. And so a lot of the comedy and a lot of the uh, culture of this era, as we'll see when we look at, uh, when we listen to Fanny Bryce, um, is kind of at the juncture of this ambivalence about being Jewish and what does it mean to be Jewish? And is it something to be proud of or is it something to be embarrassed and ashamed of? Next one. 
okay, this is, this is Jessel later in, in life uh, doing one of his routines on the phone with his mother. mother. Good, right. But, uh, but he has an early vaudeville, uh, he has an early sketch that I, that I discussed in the book called Mama in the Box in which he takes his Yiddish-speaking mother to a French play and he has to translate the French play to her into Yiddish and it's kind of French and English and Yiddish and whatever and she doesn't know how to act in the theater and she's, you know, eating and she's making a commotion and whatever and disturbing people all around her and, you know, she starts yelling at the actors and they start yelling back to her then they start yelling at her in Yiddish so why are these French actors yelling in Yiddish, you know, and it's kind of like everything uh, gets all discombobulated into a general mayhem at the end. But you can see the roots of his later comedy, you know, on the phone with his mother, um, stemming, stemming from this, yes. Uh, and this is again, well, that's Ethel Merman and that's, and that's uh, Cantor, that's Eddie Cantor. Okay, the next one. That's Ethel Merman. Um, now, this was another one of the um, uh, sort of Abe's Irish Rose spin-offs from the 20s. This is um, actually a whole series of films called The Coens and the Kellys about a Jewish and an Irish family who are kind of at loggerheads with one another in the same tenement building. And this was, again, this was really a staple of the comedy of the period. It wasn't just Jews often, but it was Jews in tandem with another ethnic group, particularly with the Irish. And, um, and this was something that was funny to people throughout the country to kind of laugh at um, immigrants in general. So I think what Jews accomplished in many ways through a lot of these films and other, and other, um, and other products of culture, uh, of culture was, to, um, was to humanize not just the um, majority culture's view of Jews, but, to, but in general to humanize the majority culture's view of immigrants. Yes, next one. And this is, of course, Jolson in the, in the Jazz Singer. Okay. Now, the jazz singer, I mean, most of us think of it as about, you know, the tug between assimilation and tradition and so on, but I think there's another way of reading it as well, which is in the next slide, which is um, really of a family that has some dreams of upward mobility, <laughs> because this is the scene in which he is playing piano and singing to his mother about how much he's going to be able to get her to move up to the Bronx and to be able to live with all the other neighbors of theirs who used to be on the Lower East Side and are now living in the Bronx, and uh, sort of how their dreams of upward mobility are frustrated, in a sense, by the father's reluctance to embrace his son's success, which would mean that they would be able to be more upwardly mobile. Yeah. And this is from maybe Irish Rose. And uh, the father's on the right, and the son and, and his Irish, uh, his Irish uh, fiance. Actually, they're already married by the time it begins, but the father doesn't know that, but whatever. OK. Uh, this is also ABC Irish shows. What's interesting about, about this one and also the next one um, you can, you can, uh, is um, the, the contrast between the different representations of, of Jews, um, the way that the, uh, the father is shown. Actually, it's not, it's not even just the father, but it's the next door neighbor in particular is shown as if he just stepped off the vaudeville stage. Um, and um, the rabbi at the top, you know, has this very distinguished kind of, kind of look compared to the father who's supposed to be very, uh, you know, very much the kind of bumbling immigrant who doesn't know how to speak English yet. And then the son, all the way at the bottom, is the uh, kind of suave, you know, completely um, unethnic in many ways. He doesn't carry any of that stigma of, uh, of of obvious ethnic characteristics anymore. And on Broadway, actually, when the Broadway production opened, he was played by a non-Jewish actor, uh, which is something that we, we see uh, today, that often, non -Jewish, uh, that often Jewish roles are taken by non-Jewish actors. Um, Martin Short, I think, is going to be speaking here on Sunday night. Uh, he's going to be interviewed by Dick Cavett, right, after the big parade. Um, so uh, there was a quite a quite a while. I mean, most of the 20th century, when non-Jewish role, when 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 uh, Jewish roles were taken by Jews, there were plenty of Jewish actors around who could play Jewish roles. There was you know Zero Mostel and Phil Silvers and so on and so on. Um, and nowadays we don't have so many Jewish actors of that caliber, and so Jewish roles are uh, increasingly being taken by uh, by non-Jews. Has anyone seen the the production of Awake and Sing that was on Broadway last season? 
almost com a, a cast almost completely, at least the major roles, almost completely composed of Italian Americans. <laughs> Go ahead. And this is the top. No, another one of these actors who played a lot of Jewish roles. No, it's Ed Wynn actually. And that's Keenan Wynn and and uh, his immigrant mother. And I was just reading the biography that that Keenan Wynn wrote about his father, and they um, they moved to Great Neck, where I where I grew up, uh, when he was a boy. But his mother was Catholic. Edwin's wife was Catholic, so they raised their son Catholic. And he talks in the book about having his first communion in Great Neck, and it just kind of struck me. It just seems so strange, you know. I mean, having grown up in Great, the communion in Great just didn't. But actually, one thing that's interesting about that book is that he really suggests that he um, he was never comfortable with his with his identity. He never quite knew who he was and never had a grasp of whether or not he you know felt Jewish in any way or, or whatever that uh, and his parents didn't have a good marriage. Go ahead. And this is the last slide. So this is uh, a Rube Goldberg invention. I don't know how many of you are planning to have turkey for Rosh Hashanah next weekend. Anybody? Sheila, good. Um, most people are probably having brisket, right? How many of you are having brisket? Nobody's having brisket either. What are you having? Chicken, OK, chicken. All right. So uh, the reason why I like Rube Goldberg is because I also see him as someone who, he was a cartoonist, a very well-known cartoonist of the 1920s. He didn't just do inventions, but he's best known for that, obviously. But the idea of inventing a new form of Jewish identity, that um, even though he wasn't particularly interested in his work in terms of Jewishness, that you can see his, and also Ed Wynn did a lot of, uh, speaking of Ed Wynn, a lot of his performances on Broadway were these crazy contraptions. Does anybody remember that? Uh, crazy kinds of inventions. Like he used a um, typewriter, uh, what do you call the typewriter carriage as a corn cob eater or something, and it would go back and forth while you were eating the corn so you wouldn't have to move your mouth. It would just kind of move back and forth for you. You know, things like that. Um, so I don't know if you can read this, but this is the way to carve a turkey. The, um, the you put a bowl of chicken salad on the window to cool. The rooster recognizes his wife in the salad and is overcome with grief. So he starts crying. His tears saturate the sponge, which pulls the string, which releases the trap door. And then that allows the sand to go through into the pail. And then that makes the seesaw go, go up, which lifts the cover of the ice cream freezer. And then the penguin is up there on the top. He feels the, the draft from the ice cream freezer. He thinks he's at the North Pole. He flaps his wings for joy, there, uh, thereby fanning the propeller which revolves the turns of cogs, which causes the turkey to go back and forth over the cabbage cutter until it is sliced to a frazzle. Don't get discouraged if the turkey gets pretty well messed up. It's essentially would eventually become turkey hash anyway. OK. I hope this is helpful to somebody. <laughs> OK. Can we have the um, Fanny Bryce, which all of you will recognize instantly?
What is this song really about? Poverty. It's about poverty, okay. What else? What is that? Aspiration. Aspiration, okay. Yes. What what are the feelings that the singer has? What's the dominant feeling that's being expressed in the song? Sadness, second classness, and what else? Self-pity, okay, right, because everything that she owns is pre-owned. <laughs> uh, what are some of the examples in the song? Her what? Her shoes, her pajamas, her piano, her boyfriend, right? I mean, it's like her very identity is secondhand. There's nothing about her that's original, that's new, right? And so I see this song as really about her Jewishness. It's really about the kind of ambivalence that she has about being Jewish, which is something that was handed down to her from her parents, from her ancestors. It was secondhand, right? And she and the other members of her generation are conflicted about what to do with being Jewish. On the other hand, this became one of the most popular songs of the era and one of the most popular songs of the 20th century. And as a footnote, which I mentioned in the book, I found a, uh, I was either, I think it was Bizarre, Glamour or Bizarre, one of the fashion magazines that talked about, uh, it was an interview with her daughter and about how in real life she loved to buy the most expensive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> designer clothes <laughs> that she could. I thought that was interesting. Um, but yeah, this is a song about her, uh, her sense of, um, self-pity, her sense of, of shame with, at, at her oranges. And I found that um, actually Secondhand Rose is so popular that it's been recorded by many different artists, including, of course, Barbara Streisand, who did the, the, the uh, show Funny Girl. But also Secondhand Rose, the name Secondhand Rose, if you look up secondhandrose.com on the internet, you find a uh, supposedly the, the biggest um, vintage wallpaper store in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I also found a reference to it as, as a store for um, uh, helping abused and um, battered women to get back on their feet. And I also found it as the name of a folk rock band in China. A Chinese, a Chinese music group calls itself Secondhand Rose. Okay, could we have the, um, the video? Now I want you to keep thinking about that as you watch the, uh, the video clip. Yeah. Uh, hold on. I'm oh, sorry. Mm hmm. Good. Did everybody hear that? There's a kind of self satire that's, that's contained in it. That's something we'll return to in a second. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Sorry about this thing on the bottom. I don't know why, why it's doing that. But this is from a film uh, called Glorifying the American Girl from 1929. Uh, the Ziegfeld, all about the Ziegfeld, the lavish Ziegfeld uh, musicals of the day. We talked about Ziegfeld earlier. So there are all these 
scantily clad dancers and this very opulent production and so on and so forth. Please, Eddie Cantor's neck. Really? Oh, that's... Very well-dressed audience. Ah, there you are, my boy. You've got the finest suit of clothes in the whole place, I'm telling you. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Don't raise your arms. I'm asking you, please, don't raise your arms. You've got the finest suit in the whole place. A uh, mole? Uh, Mo? And you got that package wrapped up yet? Go ahead, kill me. Go ahead, kill me. Hey, uh, my dear man, I want to tell you something. That's the best suit of clothes we got in the whole house. You won't be able to wear that suit out. You'll be ashamed. I'm you telling you. You've got the finest suit of clothes in the whole place. Oh, don't listen to him. He's a damn fool. Go ahead. But I'm please. telling you, I've got the finest suit in the whole place. I'm coming against against you. Coming coming against the time. Goodbye. Uh, Mo, What's listen that? to me, Mo. Don't you tell anyone to tie him, damn fool. Don't you ever tell anyone to tie him, damn fool. I didn't know it was a secret. Uh, would you mind coming upstairs, walking up to our clothing department? You see, uh, our elevator just broke down. Not at all. And I want to let you in on something very secret. We have just received the shipment of goods that was supposed to go to the Kuppenheimer Company. Now, you know the Kuppenheimer Company, the best clothes in the whole world. Now, I'm going to show you some styles, some styles, some, some material, some cuts that you will be surprised. Well, here we are in the clothing department. Say, you've got quite a building here. I should say so. I want to tell you something, my dear man. That's the best suit of clothes we got in the whole house. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? What's the matter? It's the man's own suit. Go ahead, kill me. Go ahead. Uh, take off your hat and coat, my friend. Make it go perfectly at home. That's the idea. Let me see. You're taking about uh, 46 stars. Now, I've got for you here something very beautiful. Here is a lovely golf suit. A very handsome English walking suit, the latest cut. Comes right straight from the Piccadilly. That's oh, lovely. Look at those shoulders. Beautiful. How that fits Wonderful. Take a walk around. See Wonderful. how you feel in the suit. Just move around. Easy. There's a nail sticking me in the back. That's not a nail. That's our own invention. You know how you go into a restaurant, you hang up your umbrella and your hat, and you get in there just so you think somebody's going to steal it? This is our own invention. When you take this, you can take your umbrella and your hat and you hang it up, and nobody can steal it from you. Take a walk. Take a walk. How does it feel now? It's all right, but I don't eat in a restaurant. Look. Eat in your Aunt Sarah's house. Eat in cat. I don't care where you eat, but you'll take the suit. I'll tell you what to do. Are you a sport? Yeah. You play casino? Yeah. You take the suit, and we'll send you home in a taxi cab, all right? Call him a taxi cab, all right? No, I, I want a belt in the back. Good for I'll fix you. You're going to get a belt. And here is something very lovely. Here is a very lovely suit. Here is a suit that the, only the gentlemen and the whole people in the room. Yes, of course, the buttons don't meet, but <laughs> I don't think they've ever been introduced. Don't tell jokes. You see what this suit is? It's the latest Palm Beach model. All the people is going to wear two button sack suits this season. No, I like the one button. One button? We're here to please you, my dear man. That's all that you are. How do you like that? <laughs> too tight for me. Too tight. That's all you got to do is to tell me. Turn around. Go ahead. Now, take a walk. How does that feel? It's all right, but a little cold in the back. Cool. That's what you call the cooling system. That's the new fridge you there. With a suit like this, you couldn't get hot under the collar. You see what I mean? You like the suit? He likes it. He'll take it, you'll take it. He'll take it, he'll take it, he'll take the suit. All right? I want a belt in the back. All right. Listen, did anybody see you come in? That's all I wanted to know. Listen, I have for you a very pretty smoothie jacket. I think you will like this. Every gentleman bears a, a smoking jacket. Too this. big for me. Too big? All right, more alteration. What do you mean alteration? Where? One for alteration. But where do you need alteration? That fits him like a kimono. What's the matter with you? Look at that. Look at that. What's the matter with you? Look at that. Don't you know what it is? That saves you from buying mittens in the wintertime. Can't you see that? We're saving you money? No, I like to have it fixed up. You want it fixed up? So I'll fix it up. So fix it up. What have we got to do? All right. Take this down. Raise the shoulders. Raise the shoulders. About six inches. Six inches. Fix the lapel. Fix the lapel. The two lapel. Both lapel. Give him a cut here. A cut here. Give him a gash here. A gash on the left. And give him a slice here. Right in the middle of the slice. Above the appendix. On top of the appendix. Right. I, I haven't got appendix. Have you got tonsils? What are you telling me what you got there? Let's take suits here. You want patch pockets? 
You want patch pocket? You want patch? Patch pocket. You want patch? Patch pocket. You want patch? Give him patch. All right, you'll get patch. You'll get patch. Give him patch there. Patch pocket. Well, how do you like that? How much is it? Take a look at the bag there. T.O.T. Twenty-six fifty. That's too much. Twenty-six fifty. Twenty-six fifty. Let me explain to you. The suit cost us alone wholesale twenty-four dollars. We are paying rent here a year, ten hundred and seventy-five dollars. It costs us for gas and for electricity every month, thirty-five dollars. We are paying the police protection. They shouldn't break the windows, twenty-five dollars. Last winter, my wife was sick. What did it cost me? Three hundred and twenty dollars. I'll charge you fifteen dollars. Here, add it up. What could be making profit on a suit like that? Say, maybe I don't have to have a trick. That's what I'm it's telling you. You don't have to have a trick. He's intelligent. I could tell by his hair. Of course, you don't have to have a trick. You know why you don't have to have a stick? Because you don't have to have a stick. Huh, some joke. <laughs> you like it? You'll take it. You'll... I, 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 I... Listen, say belt and I'll kill you. I'm telling you. Well, I, I like a blue shirt suit. Oh, all oh, oh, right. We're right. here for this. Sure. 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 If you want a blue shirt suit, here you are. Here is a nice blue shirt suit for you. Blue shirt? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's what you call pale navy blue. Pale navy blue. Pale navy. <laughs> Looks like banana color to me. Do you want the suit or do you want vegetable? What are you looking for? You want, it's too light. Too, you, you want a dark? A dark blue double-breasted suit. He knows what he wants. Here's a dark blue double-breasted suit for you. Huh? Some, uh, some best best Look at that. That's what you call two and one. Two and one. It's a suit and an overcoat combined. You like a suit like this? Well, I like a blue shirt with a white stripe. With a white... Oh, with a stripe. With a stripe. Sure. Say what you want. There you are. How do you like that? <laughs> I look like a zebra. Don't talk like a jackass. What is a zebra? A sport model jackass. You know, it's nothing. You like the suit? My dear man, you look ten years younger to me. You're just a kid. I wish I had a balloon to give you. I'll tell you something. You're a different man. Your own friends wouldn't recognize you in that suit. Your own mother couldn't recognize you now in that suit. Really? Take a look in the light. Go on, Clyde. Take a look at the material. That's what you got to do. It's all right. I like it. You know what I like about this is strong material. Yes, sir. I always like yes, sir. strong clothes. What, uh, what can I do for you? I just tried this suit on. You see, even I didn't recognize you. I thought you liked it. I want a belt, Mr. Pat. You want a belt? Please, I'm going to say, say, there you go. No, stop a minute. Don't be such a... Here, look, here, take that. Look, I've got for you here a very beautiful hunting suit. Well, there is what I call a hunting suit. The finest hunting suit that I have ever seen a in this suit. place. A hunting suit? Yes, a hunting suit. What do you call it a hunting suit for? We've been hunting for the pants for two years. Now, wait a minute. Here is a hat that goes with that suit. How do you like that hat? Good? It's too big for me. Give me a hand. Give me a hand. What's too big about it? I'm telling you, for two years, you could wear that hat. Take a walk. For two years, my dear man, you could wear that hat. Yeah, but my hand will get tired. You change your hand. You change your hand. You've got to tell them everything. Well, how do you like it? Well, I'll take the hat. And the coat. No. And the coat. No. Yeah, listen. They've been together for two years. Why should you separate the hat and the coat? No, I'll take the hat, but I want to look in the mirror. <laughs> Why should you look in the mirror and get discouraged? Can't you take my word for it? Would he lie to you? We're not in business for that. Well, how do you like that? Well, my dear, let me tell you something. When you're wearing a suit like that, you will be the talk of the town, I'm telling you. You could go to a baseball game, and you start up, and you get up, and you holler, Hooray for Babe Ruthie! Knock a home run! And the people are saying, who is that fresh man? And they see you and say, ah, oh, he's not fresh. He's wearing a Kuppenheimer coat. You see what I mean? You go to a dance at night. You're coming up to a woman and say, pardon me, could I have the next waltz with you, if you please? And she says, he's too short. Ah, but he's a Kuppenheimer. So if you wear a Kuppenheimer clothes, you can't go wrong. I'll tell you something. In, in Washington, in the inauguration, what do you think Coolidge is saying to Hoover? I want a baton hat. Let's be honest with you. If you want us to the belt in the back, we'll have to make it order. That's sure? Yes. Uh, how much is it? Well, you're a short man. You take about two and a half yards. Sixty-five dollars. That's too much. Now, wait a minute. We'll come to times. Wait a minute. Would you go to fifty to fifty? No, sir. Would you spend forty-five dollars? No. Now listen, I'm telling you, a suit we're going to sell you. You wouldn't get out of here without a suit. That you know. That you know, don't you? You want to save ten dollars? Yes. You want to save ten dollars? Walk upstairs. Oh. Come along. That's all you got to do? 
will be here to please yeah. you. We want to take care of you. I'll come out, take the gentleman's measure. Come up here and I'll take your measure. The neck is 25. 25 in the neck. And the Adam's apple is seven and a half. Seven and a half in the Adam's apple. And the shoulders is 31. 31 in the shoulders. What are you singing? Get up there. Get up there. What are you singing? Come on, come on. Who's the quartet? Bus quartet. Take, take down the pants. What? No, listen. I mean, take down in the book. Okay. Uh, we're running out of time, but if well, I can play the rest of it after the when we're having uh, refreshments, if you want. Um, yeah, this is a segment of a movie from Glorifying the American Girl. So, um, but this was a routine that was done, and was done in, in a number of Broadway shows that, that Cantor starred in, and it was a, a, um, I heard that it was ultimately done on television, but I haven't been able to find the television version of it. But this is um, the complete routine. Uh, a belt in the back, or something that's called Joe's Blue Front. But a belt in the back, obviously, is a comic title because he keeps asking for a suit with a belt in the back, but what does he keep wanting to give him? <laughs> A belt. Um, so remember, right? Uh, Secondhand Roses from 1921. This is from 1929, although it was done starting in 1919, 1920. Uh, 1920s Jews are not living anymore on the Lower East Side, and uh, and yet Jews are being shown. And Jews aren't. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know if his accent is even quite right. It seems kind of weird. <laughs> um, uh, Jews aren't uh, the second generation Jews are not talking in Yiddish accents they're not acting as stereotypically as their parents did but they're still obsessed in some way with this, with this Lower East Side immigrant Jewish culture so what's going on in this, in this clip what kind of Jewish stereotypes are being shown yes are they negative Right, right. Uh, so the Jewish, what we say, the shyster, the uh, the the dishonest, uh, you know, who will do anything to to make money, to make the sale. What kind of a store is it? Is it a, you know, is a schlocky, <laughs> a store with steps where they have to go around? Right, this is brilliant. Um, also, there's a little bit of a of a satire of the uh, synagogue service in there. Right at the the last point there, did anybody notice the kind of tune that they're singing? Yeah, it's kind of like the Talmudic sing-song type of thing, right? And he chimes in with Sweet Adeline because he's completely mixed up about what they're about what they're trying to do. So taking these two these two things together, the Fanny Bryce secondhand rose and the uh, Eddie Cantor belt in the back, what can we say about the attitudes that the second generation had towards the Lower East Side and towards their Jewish identity? Yes. They were making fun of it, but they were making fun of it in a particular way, right? I mean, they were making fun of it with a kind of tremendous, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the films of this period were Jewish, were Jewish films. This is a film about Ziegfeld, about the Jewish uh, embrasario. Uh, who was making them? I'm trying to remember who the director of Glorifying the American Girl was. I'll, I'll, let me check. Oh, who's producing it? What the film company was? I'm not sure. I have to I have to check. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Right, and there's been a lot recently about Jewish, the, supposedly the Jewish movie moguls who were making all these films that didn't have any Jewish content in them, that didn't have any Jewish characters in them, that were all about assimilation, but not true of the 20s. In the 20s, there were all these films that were made by Jewish producers, Jewish companies, Jewish directors that were about Jewish life on the Lower East Side. So it's not, that stereotype doesn't work with the 20s, although it does work with the 30s and 40s. Yes? Uh huh. Mm hmm, yeah.
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I can't remember. I know the film that you're talking about. Yeah, I don't remember the director's name. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, but what else? What else kind of connects these two things, the secondhand rose and the um, and the Eddie Cantor clip? Their exaggerations, right? Uh, they're not embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The stereotypes are embraced in some sense. Uh, they're taken for granted, but they are. Aren't, but aren't they sort of transcended in a certain way by the by the way that they're by the way that they're handled? Uh huh. And also, what are they? What are they both uh, about in large part? The secondhand rose is about a, lo a lot of it in terms of her secondhand clothes that she wears and the clothing shop on the Lower East Side. And we know that Jews were so involved in the clothing industry in this country, in the garment industry in this country, starting in the 1880s when they came here. And a huge uh, percentage of Jews uh, were active in one way or another in the clothing industry. So the whole association of clothes and kind of taking those associations with clothes and reworking them in different ways, I think you see in both of these examples. Yes? Mm-hmm. Interesting. I think you're right. Yes. Last comment, because we have to end at 9 o'clock. That's a good question. I don't. I haven't looked so much at other at other ethnic groups. I mean, uh, the Irish were shown in a lot of these films about Jewish-Irish intermarriage, um, in equally ways. But um, I'm trying to think about other groups. I don't know. Actually, that's a good question about how other group whether other groups were shown with the same kind of um, mix of uh, kind of um, ambivalence and ebullience and confidence that that the Jewish films were. You guys have such great comments. This is wonderful. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I've heard about it. It's not keeping up with the signs. It's uh, what is it? Something like that with the signs. Yeah, the bar mitzvah about the bar mitzvah. Yeah. Uh, now, actually, that's a. This is something that I, I would like to end with. I'm glad you mentioned this because I would like to end with a kind of question about whether or not some of the comedy of today. The Jewish comedy of today, which is which is equally self-confident and um, and um, you know explicit about uh, Jewishness. I mean, you know, Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David and Sarah Silverman and all this whole new breed of Jewish comics are not in any way afraid to put their Jewishness front and center. Um, but sometimes I wonder whether there's not a similar kind of element of a certain kind of uh, yeah, self, not just self-deprecation, but, but um, I mean, at the beginning of Sarah Silverman's uh, movie, Jesus is Magic, which is not a movie that I'm very enamored of. I find it really uh, very almost repulsively vulgar. But, um, but she says something at the beginning of it about humiliation and about how comedy starts in, in humiliation. And so maybe it's just something about comedy in general. But um, certainly for those of you, uh, how many of you are fans of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm? A lot of you. Right, I mean, that's what it's all about. It's all about his finding ways to, to humiliate himself. To her, you know, it's all about the comedy of social embarrassment. And so I wonder whether or not there is some kind of a line from the Jewish comedians of the 1920s to the, to the Jewish comedians of today. And now it's exactly 9 o'clock, so I promise to end at exactly 9 o'clock. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for being such a wonderful, wonderful audience. Thank you. And so we're going to have uh, some Jewish rituals now. 
and then um, I'm going to stick around to uh, be able to talk to whoever wants to talk about things, and we'll play the rest of the clip for anybody who wants to watch the rest of the clip. It's, it's only about another five or six minutes, I think. Hello. First of all, thanks, thank you again. We appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Sharon Goldman. I'm the program director here at the Broffman Center at the 92nd Street Y. And um, um, for those of you who would like to stick around, um, Yaron is going to do Kiddush. And then we have a bar with wine and complimentary, of course, wine and uh, refreshments. And underneath that table are snacks. And so we welcome you to stay. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.